I ain't got nothing else to prove to you if I if I took you out of Coppin and Walbrook and got you to Primrose with no credit, with no bank statements, with no wealthy donors, but everyday hard-working black people, if I did this, what more do you think I could do? Isaiah chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. Now I tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I'll take away its hedge and it'll be destroyed. I'll break down its wall and it'll be trampled. I'll make it a wasteland and it won't be pruned or cultivated. And briars and thorns will grow there. I command the clouds not to rain on it. You may be seated. I want to preach for a little while today. and My last Sunday as your pastor. I want to preach using as a subject. We're coming out smelling like a rose. Coming out smelling like a rose. Empowerment, I'm grace beyond measure. To have both of my parents alive and in appropriate health. Give God a hand clap of praise for that blessing. My mother most recently passed a significant milestone, passing 70 years of age. And I wanted to give her a gift that I thought would be meaningful. And I stumbled upon something that I'd never seen before called the Innovative Tower Garden. The Innovative Tower Garden, which is actually an um, aeroponic growing system that utilizes technology from NASA. The harvest, I want you to hear this, the harvest from this Innovative Tower Garden, the harvest can bloom without using any dirt. It only needs, Sean, water and nutrients. Astonishingly, with the advancements of technology, you can now grow with this tower garden 20 different vegetables, herbs, fruits, and flowers, and all you need is less than two square feet. Considering that my parents live in a condominium and are health conscious, I concluded that this tower garden would be the ideal gift. The plants grow three times faster and yield 30% more than any typical farm. My three youngest daughters who sit with you today always slow to give me their list for what they want for Christmas and then act like it's urgent the week before. So I calculated in my mind so that they would be well-rounded and have some conscience of what it means to be a steward in the earth. But on that list, I was going to give them a tower garden as a part of their Christmas. I thought about it, but realizing that they are now in their early teen years, I thought against it. Because I thought the message would be bad. I didn't want my children and I don't want your children to think for one moment that you can grow without dirt. Having dirt on you is significant to your maturing and for who you are to be in life. John Fitzgerald Kennedy, the former president of these yet to be United States of America said, if you ever want to see a tremendous success, look for a great failure. 
pruning is the procedure for proactive endings. Dr. Henry Cloud in his book that I want to recommend to you entitled Necessary Endings offered that a rose bush can reach its full potential. Watch this. It cannot come to its full potential without going through pruning. The catch is that the gardener can't aptly prune if he can't see what he wants to develop. Jack Welsh was former head of GE, grew the company from 14 billion to 410 billion, making it the most marketable company of its time. His model and mantra was that if GE wasn't number one or number two in that market, it should be cut. Benjamin Mays, the former president of Morehouse College, once said, why run a race just to come in second place? Succeeding ought to be your aim. Every year, Jack Welsh would eliminate the bottom 10% of his workforce. His mind was, whoever isn't helping you build up is weighing you down. And the critical question that I've got to ask you almost rhetorically, going into 2019, are you strong enough to cut people who are not equipping you. If you're an urban dweller like me and don't have anything close to a green thumb, then you probably don't know, hear this very carefully, that rose bushes produce more buds than the plant can sustain. The plant has enough life and has enough resources to feed and nurture only the buds that can come to full potential. It can't bring all of them to bloom. There's only so much you can do for certain people because there are some people who are committed to not growing, who are committed to not changing, who are committed to never developing. The caretaker's responsibility is to examine which ones are worthy of care and attention. And so the gardener prunes the ones that aren't worth it so that the bush can live. In this season of your life, you cannot expend any more energy on people who drain you. People whose only aim and intention is to use you. And they only want you to grow until you don't eclipse them. The reason why pruning is necessary is that it frees up the nutrients to go to that which has the greatest potential. And many of you don't even realize why it is that the hand of God cut some people out of your life. He cut some people out of your life only because he wanted to see you grow. And as long as they stay close, you would never maximize God's vision for who you're supposed to be. I know this seems inordinate and even uncomfortable, if not strange, but you ought to thank God for who he cut. You didn't understand it or like it in the season, but now in hindsight, you got to thank God for the surgical hand of God that shifted some things out of your life. There are some branches, some branches that are sick or diseased. And as a result, they have no possibility of ever making it. And the heart of the gardener will make him fertilize that which isn't growing. Nurture was not growing. Monitor was not growing. Because he so badly wants to see it grow, even though it hasn't shown any potential for growth. 
And many of us are afflicted with Christ-like compassion. We keep thinking we can save people who don't want to be rescued. We keep applying CPR to people who can breathe on their own. We keep trying to drag people out of situations that they always run back to. And God is saying, you don't even understand why I always equipped a rose with a thorn. I had to give you a thorn so whoever touches you has got to do so delicately because I've invested too much in you for you to be mishandled with people who don't see your greatness, your excellence, and even your possibility. Then there are the branches that are just dead and they take up space. Healthy branches need room to reach their full length and their full height. But it becomes impossible for them to grow when dead branches keep taking up space. The anointing of Jabez is to always have a yearning within the anointed to suggest whatever it is that I have is too small for me, that I need God to enlarge my territory. I humbly submit that this is your hour to break free. That God is getting ready to give you more room to occupy your gift, your potential, your capacity, and your ability. Whatever it is that you have right now that does not match God's vision for your life has got to be knocked down so that God can enlarge the walls. Cutting is not quitting. Did you hear what I just said? Cutting is not quitting. As a consequence, a coach knows that if I want to make it to the championship, there are some people I got to cut. It is not personal. It's for the good of the team. There are some people that God had to cut out of your life. Why? Because he wanted to see you win. And as long as you keep them losers on the bench, you'll never make it to where God has for you to be. So he says, I need you to be with people who are starters, not people who just want to ring. What are you doing? That you just keep taking up space. That you refuse to grow. Refuse to stretch. Refuse to test the possibility of the parameters of God's intention for your life. Without any pruning, the rose remains a bud and never begins to blossom. Without the cuts, the rose is average at best. And God never has in mind an average rose bud. And so I've got to ask you, why are you settling for an average life? For an average existence? For an average relationship? And maybe everything is average for you, not because you're under attack, but because you refuse to make cuts. You refuse to cut habits, lifestyles, perspectives, relationships circles, false indebtedness, and yet you're in the same place. And God is saying, what you waiting for? I gave you the scissors. You're so preoccupied with not hurting people's feelings that you're hurting your destiny. Oh, you just missed what I just said. There's an occasion in Luke chapter 13 where Jesus is walking along the roadside and he comes upon a tree. And he comes upon a tree, hear this, that has borne no fruit. And it wasn't just this year. Three years of no productivity. Three years of nothing to point to. Three years of nothing active happening in his life. 
And Jesus, when he sees it, is upset. And he asked that tree what he's asking many people who are in this room. What have you done with the last three years of your life? Every year you make a New Year's resolutions. Giving up stuff for Lent that you hold on to for 10 days. Talk about how it's going to be different. You've all done your vision board. Your affirmation wall. Self-help podcast. And you still in the same place. And God said, I'm sick of it. I want to cut down. This is what the master said. Any person that's not productive. And the gardener shows up and pleads mercy on my behalf and on yours. And pleads to the father, Lord, don't cut him down. Give him one more year. One more year for me to put fertilizer around it. One more year to water it. One more year to prune. And the question that the theologian never asked, Gardner, what were you doing them other three years? Why do you have to be threatened to treat me right? Don't wait to value and appreciate me only when you think I'm going to leave. God, I can't hear nobody here. While I'm here, you ought to be taking care of me and loving me and valuing me when you see what my potential is. God said, you don't have any more years to waste. Not, not now you want to be faithful now you want to cry now you want to worship you should have been productive before today there ought to have been something in you that reminded you my assignment is not connected to a man my potential has nothing to do with Jamal Bryant. But if God be for me, who in the world can be against me? And some of you ought to shout because this is going to be the greatest year of production for your life. And if you believe it, give God thanksgiving for it. I got to say something to you. And I don't know how many of your faith is going to resonate with this. But I want to say it and I hope your faith will receive it. God said you will be more productive in the next three weeks than you have the last three years. God, you'll miss your prophecy. I better say it again. I said the next three weeks of your life are going to be more productive than the last three years of your life. If you know you serve that kind of God, give God thanksgiving for what God is getting ready to do. I said, and I got to do it. But I can only do it. After you go through the cut. After you go through the separation. After you deal with the displacement. And friends, when we get to Isaiah chapter 5, we get to eavesdrop on a private love letter between God and the children of Israel. The truth be told, it almost sounds like a Dear John letter. God is fed up with them. When you listen to the heartbeat of God, it sounds like the lamentation of a jilted lover. Look at verse number four. He said, here you are looking around, looking despondent and sad, like your world is coming to a crashing end. 
God says to the children of Israel, to the children of empowerment, look how I took care of you. And the condition that you were in when folk didn't think you were going to come through it. I ain't got nothing else to prove to you if I, if I took you out of Coppin and Walbrook and got you to Primrose with no credit, with no bank statements, with no wealthy donors, but everyday hardworking black people, if I did this, what more do you think I can do? Then look how I've had a hedge fence of protection around you. That over the last three years, 7,000 churches have foreclosed. Look how I looked after you. That even while other ministries were getting older, yours was getting younger. Look how it is that I helped you to open up an academy with 300 students from kindergarten to eighth grade. Look how I allowed you to take over property and bring people to Jesus who had never been to church. Look how many times the devil thought he was going to shut you down, but you kept opening back up again. If you think I brought you this far, Look around at your protection. Now you started this church on access cable with a Panasonic camcorder. And now you're being seen around the world. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. And for some of you, if you really want to shout, you, in, you don't need to look at the building. Look at the person next to you. Because you're sitting next to a conqueror. Somebody that survived hell in high water, but they're able to tell the enemy, look at me, I'm a testimony. I didn't make it on my own, but somebody prayed for me. He says, I, because you took my blessings for granted, I'll turn your promised land into a wasteland. If you begin to think that it ain't me and it's invested in one man, then you've missed my hand. Maybe you forgot I'm a jealous God. And the moment you start calling the pastor's name more than the savior's name, I got to do something about it in order to shift your perspective. He says, Israel, when I am through with you, when I wash my hands of you and turn my back on you, You'll know it. You'll know it because when I am done with you, I'll stop cutting. Oh, God, help me. You'll grow with no cuts. But the sign that I'm still with you is that I'll prune what you don't need in order for you to get to the next level. I want you to know that in the Old Testament, whenever there was a sacrifice, he did it through lamb, sheep, and goat. But in the New Testament, when God is making a sacrifice, he don't use animals, he uses a person. So he said empowerment to show that I love you, I'll cut your pastor. And I'll make him go through something just so that you'll know how to bleed in public and how to stay when you should lose your mind. I'll cut you and still let you grow. Be seated, please. I'm cutting you. Hallelujah. And I'm only cutting you because I care. I'm only cutting you because I love you. 
I'm only cutting you because I got plans for your life. Those of y'all that ain't lost nothing this year, shut up. But, but those of y'all that took a hit and had to readjust and put your life back in the perspective. But you're able to say, through it all, I learned to trust in Jesus. And I learned to trust. Trust in God. For the last time, I need you to be seated. Because I'm making you go through the cuts. Hallelujah. Because you got unnecessary stuff. Stuff that's blocking you from going to the next level. For fully occupying the potential and the vision and the picture that I have for empowerment. And the picture that I have for empowerment doesn't have Jamal Bryan as the center. I got Jesus in the center of the picture. And I don't know why y'all in here tripping like you ain't never lost nobody. But in spite of whoever you lost, can you thank God? You still had God on your side. See, some saints only know how to shout when they gain. But how many of y'all got enough sense that whenever I lose, God's making room? You, you didn't hear what I just said. I said, whenever I lose something, God is making room. So we're coming. We're coming through it. Hallelujah. We're coming through it. We're coming through it. We're coming through it. Whoever bets against empowerment, you get may lose your money. We coming through it. Whoever underestimates the power of God on this building, you getting ready to be embarrassed. Keep our church name out your mouth. God's got glory in store for this ministry. We coming through it. He's wonderful counselor. He's mighty God. He's the Prince of Peace. Can I tell you my favorite part? He is the Rose of Sharon. God helped me and he didn't become the Rose of Sharon until he came out the grave. Sometimes you gotta survive a near death experience just for you to come out smelling like a rose. Would you look at the person beside you and tell them the last three years of my life have been hectic. I've had a attack I've had trial after trial I had my name dragged through the mud I had bills that I couldn't pay I had ex-friends stab me in the back I had family members that wouldn't support me I had a job that laid me off but I came to tell the devil I'm coming out smelling like a rose if you believe it give somebody a high five and tell them the worst is over the best is yet to come don't wait till the battle is over but shout like you're coming out of it give him glory like you're coming out of it give him praise like you're coming out of it and can nobody do me like jesus can nobody do me like the lord he picked me up he turned
Take that neighbor by the hand. Somebody's hand is in your hand. 